Welcome to Where Parents Talk. My name is Leanne Castellino. Our guest today is a clinical professor at the School of Optometry and Vision Science at the University of Waterloo. Dr. Debbie Jones is also lead clinical scientist at the Center for Ocular Research and Education, also at the University of Waterloo, and she's a mother of two. Dr. Jones joins us today from Waterloo. Thank you so much for taking the time. You're welcome. My pleasure. Dr. Jones, when we look at overall health of an individual, and we're talking about, you know, taking into consideration mental, physical, social, emotional, where does eye health and where should eye health fit uh, when we're talking about children, youth, and young adults? That's a great question. I mean, vision is so fundamental to everything that we do. We know that for young children, you know, 80% of learning is visual. And it makes sense that if you see well, you have a better chance of performing well educationally. Um, and socially, if you're you know, out in the schoolyard and your vision is poor, you're not seeing your friends who are beckoning you in the corner to say, come over and play. You go swimming with your friends, or maybe you don't go swimming with your friends because in the pool, you're not seeing well and you don't feel safe. So it is about um, education, about a feeling of security and safety, and, and generally um, being more socially confident when you have good vision. Without question. Now, your research area and your field of expertise is in pediatric optometry. What current trends are you seeing generally in pediatric optometry that you're paying attention to? So one of the biggest things is we're seeing more and more children with myopia. And myopia is also called, called nearsightedness. And that means that if you have myopia, you see clearly up close and you don't see clearly in the distance if you're not wearing a vision correction. And that in itself, you may think and parents may think, well, so, you know, my child needs to wear glasses, no big deal. What we know with myopia is in just the same way as children grow, um, eyes grow and eyes get longer. And it's the lengthening of an eye that leads to needing a prescription. And children who start early needing a prescription for myopia tend to progress very quickly. And so they end up needing a very strong prescription which again, you might think, eh, well, whatever, you know, the glasses are a little bit thicker. There are other consequences of having a high prescription, such as poor uncorrected vision. So your child now is in the swimming pool and now can't see clearly. Um, less options for laser vision correction in you know, young adult years um, and more risk of vision problems later in life. So ocular health problems that can actually lead to vision loss. And we're seeing a moving trend worldwide. It's a global um, epidemic. This whole myopia um, prevalence is a global issue. And we're seeing it, certainly I'm seeing it here at the School of Optometry Clinic with young patients who are needing a prescription at a much, much earlier age. Next question I'm sure is, well, why is that? Um, and there's two real reasons. Well, there's kind of two and a half reasons. One is genetic. If you have parents who have a prescription, you're more likely to have one yourself. The big change is lifestyle. So we're seeing children spending less time outside and more time inside. And what are they doing when they're inside? They're on digital devices. So they're holding things close. And we think that that prompts the visual system to say, well, if you're holding things close for the majority of the day, then I'm going to change my focus to see clearly up close and we won't worry about everything in the distance. So we are seeing a big difference in lifestyle as any parent. I mean, how many parents say to me every week, oh, please, Dr. Jones, tell him to stop playing on the iPad. Tell her that she needs to use screens less. So it, it's a problem. It's a concern for us. When you look at all the numbers and the statistics that I'm sure you are, you know, you have at the ready, is there something in particular in there? Because myopia is obviously not new. It is not an exclusively a COVID construct. But is there a statistic in there that gives you pause as a scientist and a researcher? You're right. Myopia is not new. I'm myopic and I have been since I was 11 or 12. So we know that it's not new. However, the prevalence of it is changing dramatically. We published a study in 2018, which was a pilot study. And we just looked at 
with something like 170 children in the Waterloo region. And we looked at age six to eight and 11 to 13. So two cohorts of children. And just within that small group, 30% of the children were myopic. And that's not even looking at other prescriptions or other eye conditions, and we know those exist. So 30% of that small group had myopia, and that was back in 2018. Of that 30%, about a third had no idea that they needed a vision correction. So there's a fundamental um, disconnect there between children who were not seeing well and whose parents had not taken them for an eye examination to confirm whether they were or weren't seeing well. Um, so, you know, the numbers are there in other parts of the world, parts of Asia, we have 70, 80, 90 percent of teenagers with myopia. And we're moving, you know, more and more. I don't have the numbers for Canada other than this pilot study. But anecdotally, I can say every day when I'm working with patients, we're seeing more and more young children with myopia. So how can a parent potentially detect a condition, an eye condition like myopia, not being professionals and medical professionals uh, themselves in their child? Well, I mean, we could say simply just check their vision. You know, you could look at pictures on the wall or something and say, hey, I can see that. Can you see that? But there's no substitution for routine eye exams. In Ontario, they're certainly covered by OHIP. In other provinces, there's funding for children's eye care. So, you know, cost shouldn't be a barrier. It doesn't take long. You know, we have parents that religiously take their children to the dentist. No parent looks into a child's mouth and says, oh, it doesn't look like you have cavities. We won't bother with the dentist. We shouldn't be checking a child's vision and saying, oh, it looks like you're seeing well. We won't bother with an optometry appointment. So there's no substitution for professional eye care. If you do want to you know, look out for things, then children will tend to squint if they're not seeing so well in the distance. They want to move closer. Most people have big screens now at home, you know, TVs are 75 inch TVs, so kids don't have to get too close to it. Ask the teacher at school, does the child need to move closer? But as I, I can't reiterate enough that routine eye care is the place. That's where you find out whether your child is seeing well. When should that routine eye care begin? At what age and at what interval? And you might be surprised to know that actually the Canadian Association recommends first eye exam at age six months of age. And straight away, it's like, well, hold on a second. What can that child do at six months? What we can do is we can look and make sure that things appear to be on the right track. Do the eyes look like they're working together? Are they healthy? There are some devastating eye conditions that can happen in infancy. We want to make sure that we're looking to make sure that you know, that's not the case in your child. So six months is the first one. That's kind of a, a look-see. Does everything look like it's on the right track? And then from there, we would move on typically either annually or perhaps the next one, maybe at age two or three, and then annually thereafter. So I tend to recommend every year, make it, you know, whichever month you come in, put a note in your calendar, April for my child is eye exam month and just get into that habit. Who ideally should be conducting those eye exams for your child? So you need a, a eye care professional that is fully trained. So typically that would be an optometrist. Um, some areas, an ophthalmologist might see a child, depends where you are in the world, depends where you are in Canada. But for Canadians, um, your optometrist is the person to go to. Dr. Jones, can you give us more of the background that you have you know, uncovered with respect to the correlation between myopia and screen time? Like what exactly is happening to the eye in layman's terms that is causing this when we spend you know, copious amounts of time looking at screens? Um, there's a couple of things. One, we know that children who spend more time outside tend to be less likely to be myopic. And that's thought to be natural daylight has an effect on the retina. So it actually releases a particular um, component within the retina that helps give the signal that the eye shouldn't grow longer. That's one component. We also think that those children who are outside are not on digital devices as much. When we consider the digital devices, there's so much work being done around the world on 
why, you know, that we can only put the correlation to what has changed over the last little while. And what has changed is a lot of that use of digital devices. Um, a lot of social time is spent on something that's being held close to. So the thought is if you hold something close and your eye focuses at that distance for prolonged periods of time, then the signal to the eye is to change its length so that its natural focus is at that point. So there's a direct correlation to prescription and length of focus. So, you know, if you are very nearsighted, you're naturally in focus much closer without a prescription than if you're just a little bit nearsighted, a little bit myopic, your natural focus is a bit further away. So that's the thought. It's the thought that the signaling is basically changing to say, why don't we adapt to the visual world that we're spending most of our time in? Screens are everywhere. Um, the challenge in most households these days is managing that screen time. Yeah. Is there something else that can be done outside of limiting screen time, sending kids outside, just some sort of quick sort of, you know, tips that you can offer parents in terms of how to get to the point where they are drastically reducing screen time for their kids? Um, I mean, some of it is just being able to manage the screen time and what do you do on screen? So I tend to say to parents, you know, limit the non-academic screen time because of course a lot of schoolwork here in the KW region, grade nine kids all get a Chromebook. A lot of schoolwork is done on digital devices. So let's limit the non-academic screen time as much as we possibly can. And if you are on a screen, make it in short bursts of time so maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then have the child look away. So there's this kind of little um, quirky 20, 20, 20 rule that every 20 minutes you should look away 20 feet for 20 seconds. Um, the other thing is not hold things too close. So some will say, you know, keep it at arm's distance or holding things just a little bit further away. So a few things there to help parents, but ultimately the goal is, let's limit that screen time as much as we possibly can with the very young children. As the child gets older, you can introduce screen time a little bit more. But, and again, I say to parents, there's always the moment where you've got to go to the bathroom or put the laundry on and you give your cell phone to your two-year-old. Don't beat yourself up over that. That's fine. But it's the every time, it's that babysitter option of, the cell phone or the iPad. That's what we should be trying to avoid with our very young children. And then we can increase as they get older. So on that note, is there any research around uh, how young a child is when they are exposed to screens for the first time and the potential development or acceleration of eye conditions like myopia, you talk about two-year-olds, you know, it's not uncommon to see kids younger than that in front of a screen at a restaurant, et cetera. Exactly. There's no direct correlation in the literature at the moment. One of the biggest problems is that screen time tends to be self-reported. So you are doing a study and you're, you know, the child in their natural environment, you're then asking the parent or the child or both to report how long they were on screens and they will generally under report. So, you know, it's the same with us. If you look at your, you know, weekly screen time that pops up on your phone, you go, oh gosh, I had no idea I've been on my screen quite that much. So um, it tends to be under reporting. There's some studies that are being done that have a a wearable device that will actually indicate reading distances, time spent outside. There's nothing that's been published yet that really gives us a good correlation. All we can say is we kind of know that the more screen time seems to have more an effect of an effect. As a clinician, you ask the parents, you see the child, you see the prescription. It's like, OK, I can see where that comes in. Not for every child, to be fair. You know, if you have two parents who wear a prescription, often they're very diligent about screen time. And yet that child still has a prescription. So there's some things you can't control, but some things you can. Let's talk about um you know, what steps parents might have available to them if they have a child with myopia. What, um, how does this get corrected? Is it correctable? 
And what are the typical steps that would be followed depending on the age of that child? That we are in a great position in Canada. We are uh, really at the forefront of what we have available to us for myopia. So we used to just correct myopia with spectacles. You put the vision correction on, you see clearly. I mean, you're wearing spectacles, you wear them to see clearly. They go on, you see clearly, you take them off, that's the end of it. What we have now is an option for myopia control. So we have options available to slow down progression. As I mentioned before, the earlier you start, the higher your prescription is likely to be, you're more likely to be at risk of problems later on. So we have three broad options. We have spectacles, contact lenses, and eye drops, all of which have been shown to slow down progression. So we don't just correct children now with a regular spectacle lens, we introduce myopia control or myopia management. So we can prescribe a specially designed spectacle lens that the optics of which is just a little bit different. So it, it inhibits or it slows down that eye growth. Same with contact lenses, there's various types, some that you sleep in overnight that changes the shape of the eye, others you wear during the day. And then there's also some eye drops. So there's lots of options available. We're actually probably the only country in the world or one of the few countries in the world that has access to all of the options available. So really well placed to manage our young children and stop them getting those very high prescriptions that we worry about. The treatment options that you just outlined, do they remain consistent if we're talking about tweens, teens and young adults? We know that progression tends to happen more rapidly in younger children and tends to slow down in tweens and teens. Um, but that doesn't mean we wouldn't introduce an option of myopia control in those teen years. So if you have a child, you know, why would we just limit it to children who are growing quickly? Teens are still growing. So we would still offer options. We're less perhaps aggressive in our approach because we know they're already tending to slow down a little bit, but we would certainly um, still offer options. Again, a lot of teenagers want to wear contact lenses because they're in sports and, you know, socially, perhaps they feel that that's something they want. Why not wear the special contact lens that we know slows down progression? Can myopia be corrected 100%? That's a, that's a great question. It depends what you mean by correction. Once you have a prescription, there's no going back. If you have two units of prescription, you have two units, you're likely to increase from there. Can we correct vision? Absolutely. You know, you're 2020 with glasses on, you're not 2020 with them off. So can we correct the vision? Yes. Can we cure the myopia? No, there is no going back, which again is why we want to catch it early. You don't want to wait until your child has a mid to high prescription and they go, oh, wish I'd done something sooner. Absolutely. Dr. Jones, can you take us through the correlation between physical activity and myopia? But in terms of a correlation between activity, the only correlation we really know is that those children that spend more time outside are less likely to have myopia than those children that spend more time inside. There's been quite a few studies done. Um, there was a study out of Ireland that showed that um, children who spent, I think it was two hours outside compared to um, four hours, there was a big difference in how many of the children became myopic. So the more time outside, the less likely you are. And that's, as I mentioned before, it's the impact of daylight and it's also the impact of not being inside on a digital device. So um, the correlation is there. We know it delays the onset. So, you know, can we cure myopia? No. Can we prevent the onset? We can certainly delay it. So it's way better for a child to become myopic at 11 than it is at seven because they're growing years, there's less growing years and the natural growth will be slower. You describe the current statistics and the current trends around myopia as a global epidemic. Is there anything that you'd like to see as a standard of practice uh, or just education in general to ensure that the message about myopia gets out there uh, to the, as many people as possible. 
The first thing, and I've alluded to it and mentioned it a few times, is routine eye care. Do not neglect having your child's eyes examined, even if you think they see fine. What's the worst thing that can happen? Your optometrist says, hey, their vision's great. We'll see you next year. So that's the first thing. And then if your child does show signs of myopia or early signs that they're likely to become myopic, talk to your optometrist about options. So lifestyle changes, such as spending time outside, reducing the use of screens as much as you can. And then if your child has a prescription, think about which option is going to be the best one for them to slow down the progression. Is it going to be a spectacle lens? Is it going to be an eye drop? No children, no child likes having drops put in their eyes, but maybe you can suffer that once, once a day to put a drop in to try and slow progression. Maybe it's not an eye drop. Maybe it's a contact lens because they're an athlete or they don't want to wear spectacles. Have the conversation. Broach it with an open mind that there's something that can be done to slow down that progression. And that's the best thing. We all want the best for our children. You want, you know, you would sacrifice something for yourself to, to improve the life of your child. So give them the best opportunity possible. Why do you believe that there's a disconnect out there in terms of people's understanding of what myopia is, um, you know, and trying to avoid it? Is it is it just a lack of understanding and a lack of education until it affects them? Or is there something else? I think there is an element of that, that people don't really understand that um, a child won't exhibit a problem if they have an eye problem. So they assume they will know. They'll start struggling at school. They'll tell them, you know, you assume your child will say, hey, I'm not seeing well, which just doesn't happen. Um, so I think there's that element. And sometimes I think parents fear the outcome. So they're worried if their child needs to wear glasses that they'll be bullied, which really is not the case at all. It's very socially acceptable to wear a vision correction. Um, and I think the fear sometimes keeps parents away. Um, it's almost like they know there might be a problem, but they'd rather not know. So then it's best not to ask. Um, but that's obviously not the best approach. If you were to summarize it into one key message that you want parents to hear, about myopia specifically, but certainly eye care for their children in general, what would that be? Oh, you're going to limit me to one message. Um, it has to be take your child for an eye examination. That's the overriding message. If you're limiting me to one, then that's got to be the one. Anything else that you'd like to add, Dr. Jones, on this topic? I don't think so. I think we've covered everything. I mean, just don't fear the unknown. Take your children in. Um, Embrace the fact if they are myopic that, that we have options. We are so fortunate in Canada that we have so many options available. Um, and yeah, talk to your eye care provider, talk to your optometrist, ask them for advice because they're best place to let you know what's going on with your child. Without question. Dr. Debbie Jones, Clinical Professor at the School of Optometry and Vision Science at the University of Waterloo. We really appreciate your perspective and insight today. Thank you so much. My pleasure.